On this episode, hear about deck tea stem borer, an invasive insect species in crops, as well as some of the local corn yields and Midwest soybean yields. Joe covers National Farm Safety Week. Visit necasag.org for more information. And of course, Joe has a corny joke. Hi, this is Joe Mershman. Welcome to Cup of Joe. Episode number eight, season three. Today, we have our regulars, Tommy and Turk and Ben, so... Let's get right into it. It's harvest season, lots of stuff going on. Ben, lead us off. So the past couple of weeks, we've had some guys bring in plant samples or sending us pictures of, you know, why is this bean, why are these beans dying off early? Um, these are mainly in our southern footprint. Uh, and this is another year where Dex T stem borer has been found. So I kind of wanted to go over the life cycle real quick with uh, the Dex T stem borer. Um, and I, I might say practices. the, the deck tea stem borer is kind of like the corn borer of corn, isn't it? Yep. It goes right up the pith, right? Correct. And it's also kind of like soybean gall midge that they're experiencing in western western Iowa and eastern Nebraska and, and areas like that too because they're they're all boring. They're, they're, they're tunneling pests. And it's kind of a, a U-shaped pest from the standpoint. It's, you, we, we see it a lot more in Nebraska, western Iowa, Kansas, then across Missouri, and then it kind of bends up a little bit towards uh, Indiana and that way a little bit, but it it it's not. I, I have not seen it locally here at West Point yet. Have you? No, we we haven't seen it. It takes two or three counties south into Missouri to be able to see light light infestation of the of the disease. But basically, the uh, the adult will lay its larvae. It'll tunnel in through one of the nodes in the side of the soybean plant and it'll lay its eggs. The eggs will hatch into larvae, and the larval will um, tunnel up and down that, that plant until it basically destroys the pith, and it fills that pith with chaff and uh, basically shutting that soybean plant down. Um, it can affect entire fields. It can affect field edges. It can fe- affect pockets in the field. It kind of depends on where you're at in the uh, in the in our footprint, it seems like the further south you go, south of St. Louis, it can affect entire fields. But most places where you have lighter infestations, as you get on the edges, it doesn't normally take out entire soybean fields. But uh, so basically, the the larva will tunnel down and it will go into pupate stage at the bottom of the base of the plant, basically where the, the crown of that soybean plant is at. It's because what it's ground, isn't it? Yep, it's trying to get as close to the that ground as possible because it'll stay in pupate stage until the following growing season where it'll hatch as a or it'll turn into an adult and then it'll recreate that process again so we have lots of questions it's one of those really hard pests to control because of there's no real good way to get insecticide applications because of the extended period of um, that time frame when the we go from a larval state in spring to the adult stage because it's a like a 36 day window and you'd have to have two or three applications of insecticide to knock that out so one of the ways basically that uh, the universities have talked about controlling this pest is first to reduce yield loss is harvesting early if you have the ability to harvest early because eventually you'll have sustainability problems out in those fields you'll have a bunch of lodged soybeans because there's nothing left if you let those soybeans sit out really late um, avoid early planting with short season varieties so we see this a lot as you move further south they're making three sixes and three twos and things like that work when that's not really that maturity zone um, so longer season soybeans seem to have an effect where we know where there's areas of um, heavy infestation um, cropping pattern so this doesn't affect the much of our um, growing region but sunflowers are actually a huge trap crop for dex tea stem borer so avoid um, rotation from uh, sunflowers into soybeans and then lastly one of the cultural practices we can do is tillage by burying that um, larval state by burying that larval state underground it can actually reduce um, uh, it can reduce population of that that pest in the field. So, and one of the main things is try not to do soybean on soybean. If you have to break that rotation up, get some wheat in there. Maybe do a couple of years of wheat on wheat. Do something different to break that cycle up, wheat or corn or something, because it's in the areas where we're in eight years, ten years of bean on bean that these fields get hammered year after year after year. So, that's uh. That's just one of the pests we kind of wanted to highlight this week because we've had some calls on, on, on the Dexty stem borer. 
It's an inter- interesting pest. You know, right now when you're harvesting, they're, they're down into the root zone, but you, they leave, the, the, the pith of the soybean is, would be hollow. In other words, so in other words, when you run your combine header over between the header and before you put the shaft back on, if you look at your stems and you see those stems hollowed out, uh, that's a good indication that you might have some decti stem bore in that field. You can actually, you can actually still dig that up, split and find that, them. split that, and find them if they are in there. Yeah, and and there's only generally only one decti stem bore per plant. In other words, and so if there's two of them in there, the one that's coming up from the rear will eat the one in the front as they head down. So they're cannibalistic too. So it's a pretty mean guy. So. Uh, and I've seen I've seen a lot of damage uh, in the southern areas, and the adult has these really strange antenna. I mean, they're yeah, and they're very squirrely. They they're very very hard to capture and, right. and even find. So that's why most people don't even realize they have it. Right, and they don't fly very far either. So that's one of the reasons. One of the other ways to they can control is making sure that you have your ditches cleaned up. Grass ditches are best. You don't want a lot of broadleaf weeds in your ditches to keep stuff mowed down and keep keep things nice. I mean, that's one of the other places that they they like to overwinter at. So the other, the second thing I wanted to talk about is basically we're going to kick off. We're all going to hit on how the yields are looking so far. We've had some really really impressive corn yields locally. A lot of the guys. I mean, with the with the amount of moisture we had early on in season, it pushed the corn to basically get us what we needed before the the drought happened. Corn has big tap roots; it can reach really deep before we get into those uh, August really dry spot that we had throughout a huge portion of our sales territory. So, it one of the one of our numbers that is doing extremely well this year. It's a little bit earlier than what we would normally run. Is our ninety seven fourteen? We talked about it last week. It's still throwing up really, really good numbers. I mean, everywhere in the area. I mean, it's it's we're seeing yields closer to 300 than we are 200 in the areas where nitrogen was applied, where sulfur was applied. Nitrogen's playing a huge role again this year. Where guys, I'm, I'm having our customers really look at what their nitrogen plan is because throwing it all out in the fall or throwing all the hog manure out in the fall and not coming back in and, and addressing any nitrogen in season has been a letdown for a couple of years in a row now. So, I mean, really think about what that what your nitrogen program is. And, and uh, the Stein 9714 uh, is what the population 3840 is what on in, good on the good ground and in productive soil types that 37 to 40,000 seems to really be pushing where the high yields are at. And, and they're throwing fungicide at it too, correct? Yep. I always in 30 inch rows is, is what we're and I've seen some of the yields come in and the uh, farmers can hardly uh, speak. They're so excited. I mean, uh, the, they've never seen uh, yield monitors hitting 350 and just staying there. So uh, it just shows the potential of these high population, shorter style hybrids when you manage the nitrogen, the sulfur, and the fungicide and uh, what, what they can do. And that's exactly what Harry Stein set out to do. Exactly. So in other words, as I've been talking to him and feeding him the yield results, he's saying the earlier hybrids this year are having the advantage on yield just because of what you talked about, the dry end of the season, so they were a little further along. But we'll see. We haven't gotten into the 112s and 114 days because 9714 is what, 100 and 106. They, they call it 108-day based off growing degree units, but it dries down really fast, so they kind of slid it to the left. And it's a product that we can sell from basically the Iowa line, the southern Iowa line on that latitude all the way north. So it's a phenomenal product that – if, if you got really good, high productive soils, it's something that you should definitely try. Okay. Turk? Farmers are just ecstatic about the yield potential that, that's coming in on both corn and soybeans right now, more, greater than expected. Take advantage of these prices. Uh, you know, a lot of farmers are, are, are running out of bend space, don't have room to put it. It's okay to take, take uh, corn and soybeans to town when you're getting... Uh, 360, 380, and, and 10, 10, 50 on your soybeans. It's okay to take some to town. Don't overlook next year as well. Um, eventually, uh, because South America is, is virtually out of exportable soybeans right now, we're going to see at some point, you, we're going to see a, a jump in the corn price, I believe, uh, but it's going to come a little bit later as, as corn and soybeans start fighting the acreage battle. Soybeans were in short supply. They're going to hold. They're going to hold up, but corn and soybeans will compete for acres eventually. And I think there's more potential on corn to put it in the bin if you can, 
and sell your soybeans right now. Well, I know this week they it had a little correction, but that's expected when all the combines start to roll. That uh, usually puts pressure it's, on it's, the, the basis and in, in, in the market. So um, I know I know some farmers around here sold some 1038 uh, soybeans, and uh, they're pretty excited about that because uh, less than six weeks ago, we never thought we'd even get close to $10. So. So, and the yields, I know I've, I've been getting a few soybean yields uh, called into me. You know, obviously we've been getting that early information from Danny Winings down there in Southern Illinois and in uh, Boot Hill, Missouri and Kentucky and Tennessee. Um, you know, th there's been some, you know, 80 bushel yield averages down there. They've had a lot more moisture towards the tail end. So on these 360s, these really early beans. Locally here, we had one farmer uh, bringing in uh, seed production of a new variety that's going to be for 2022, and it was running what in the uh, on the good dirt. It was running. I think the field averaged something like 62, but there was some poor dirt that was involved there, um, where they were running in the upper 70s. Upper 70s. So we are noticing. Let's talk about seed size a little bit yeah. as a group. Uh, uh, I know uh, I've, we've seen some soybeans, uh, one of our group two soybeans locally grown, 36, 3,700 seeds per pound, but yet still made what, 60? Upper 60s. Upper 60s. So how can that be? I mean, normally when you got small seed, you got s smaller yields. Well, what, what I've seen this year, and we're getting a lot of questions on the two bean pods. We're seeing a lot of two bean pods. These beans aren't going to yield. We're, 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 we're kind of scared. They haven't ran the combine out in the field yet. We're seeing a lot more with the rainfall that we've had we're seeing a lot more four and five pod clusters per node and that's pretty abnormal because of the the, the spring that we had you know we had extended heat we had extended moisture all the way through june and july and that was just a perfect storm for not the perfect storm it was the perfect um growing conditions that allowed that soybean to set up its yield potential because it thought we were we were going into 100 bushel style yield so that is what what's giving us the yield because we have all these extra beans that are sitting on that plant and that we just didn't get them filled out. So 3,700 seeds per pound is small compared to something like 2,800 seeds per pound would be a normal year for fill. I've always been told that a soybean plant will produce more pods than what it can fill. And then when it gets to like a dry end like we this year, adjust the seed size, which, which you're talking about, or it will not fill that third bean in that pod, or if it's really severe, it actually will drop pods off. So it used to be, years ago, it was always thought that, well, if we could just get the flowers all to set pods, we could raise our yields. Well, the reality of it is a soybean plant, we'll put on more pods than what it can fill, and then we'll adjust depending upon filling conditions. And that's what we're seeing, exactly what you're saying. We put a lot of pods on, so we can expect smaller seed, particularly if we didn't get range towards the end. So that, that's an interesting uh, seed quality so far. What we've seen so far on everything that's coming in uh, is good. I mean, just smaller seed, but good in this area. Now, down south, uh, I think the seed size, uh, particularly in southern Illinois, and our plant down by Olmstead, I think they're going to see more larger seed possibly this year. So it's going to be, uh, um, you know, still a lot to go yet on yield. We really don't know where we're at, but I think we're getting – a little bit of a, a tick to a slightly better than what farmers thought on both corn and soybean yields. I, I would I would agree with that. A, a larger, way larger tick on corn. I mean, they're really, really ecstatic. They don't know where the yield came from, from with a lot of guys that I've talked to, but we were really nervous we were going to see a lot of 40 bushel beans, and I don't think that's going to be the case unless the beans died off. Unless you're in the drought areas where you couldn't hold moisture, those are going to be the 45 bushel yields, but there's still going to be a lot of 60s and 70s in the the higher producing ground. Yeah, I've seen it on the sandier soil and the clay soils in the drought areas, you know, 40, 45 bushel soybeans are, are about as good as they get. So it's not all perfect out there, but uh, in areas there are some really, really, really high yields. And these enlist E3 soybeans, the Liberlink GT27s. I mean, we've done some side-by-sides this past week uh, with Extend soybeans and we didn't have any problem beating them. Nope. I mean, not at all. So, I mean, we're, we, we can look any farmer in the eye and say there's no yield drag with these products and where where that information is coming from you got to take the source i guess or consider the source yep yep definitely run into a lot of that this week joe if you're in uh you know uh, a lot of foggy air about the enlist e3 system uh being having a little yield drag and um 
I pretty much tell them, you know, check out Cup of Joe and, and, and we'll put that to bed pretty quick. And uh, especially with a lot of farmers talking about the yields. And like Ben said, they kind of go out and look out, look at the field and they see, yeah, these, I better get my ASM here because these, these beans don't look very good. And then they get in the field and they start combining these. Okay, it's a little better than what I thought. And I think that's what they're seeing. They're seeing some two bean pods, um, but they're more filled than, than what the potential could have been, I guess. So uh, a little bit of harvest update here. Uh, Nationwide, we're about 10% completed uh, with Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, a little above average right now, which makes sense to the north. The south is a little behind here, even over to Illinois and Indiana is a little below average. Um, but up north and even in, in Wisconsin and, and some of these up in western and central Iowa, we're seeing the Mohawks, the Cheyennes, the Apaches really starting to stretch their legs. They're heard Phone call, phones, phone was ringing off the hook yesterday and the day before as far as just 60, 70, 75, you know, field averages of these these early maturing beans. So the Enlist E3 soybeans have definitely shown and proved their power as far as, far as stress tolerance, you know, the genetics behind everything and, and being able to stretch their, their legs and get through this drought period that we've seen. And, and obviously, like you said, in the southwest part of the state of Iowa especially, uh, things have trailed off, but it's still pleasantly surprised compared to what we've seen in years past when drought's really taken taken over the soybeans. So, well, we hope that trend continues. Cause Absolutely, I, the farmers need all they can get to keep that keep that operation going. It takes a lot of money today to farm. Right. Well, it would be remiss if we didn't talk about get your beans on order, Joe. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, we're seeing still strong demand. Uh, uh, for uh, Enlist E3 soybeans, Liberty Link GT27s, and like I said before, you know, order early. Uh, this is the year to, to order early to make sure you get exactly what you want. Still a lot of uncertainty on the dicamba labels, if there's even going to be a label for a dicamba. I know there's, you know, there's different uh, ways that they're trying to approach the market to, to get the label back on, but, you know, whether or not the EPA is going to grant that, we don't know. Still don't have the registration for the export of the grain approval in the European Union. Still. You know, we don't know where that's going to be. Don't get caught upside down by not uh, getting what you need to control your weeds next year. Uh, and Enlist E3 and Liberlink GT27s offer you really good options for yield and uh, a non-restricted uh, herbicide uh, uh, product and, of course, neighbor-friendly. So we, we think they have all the, all the boxes checked. Like That's what Ben says. you got to check all the boxes. That brings me to uh, a couple things. Uh, it is, this past week has been the National Farm Safety and Health Week for 2020. And just uh, reminding everybody how important it is to be safe uh, as harvest approaches us, because that's when uh, things uh, get a little bit more dangerous for farmers. And, and to remember that only 1% of our population provides the food fiber and fuel in many cases for 99% of the population. So uh, farmers are really important. I know they slow you down maybe a little bit when you're driving home and in the evening, in the morning, going to work. Uh, but if he's got that big combine out there, remember he can't see you. Um, give him a little bit of room and take your time. Remember he's, he's, he's gonna put uh, food on your table for you. So uh, give him a thumbs up and, instead of a, a, a sneer when you, when you pass him. Um, also, we want to remind you that we'll continue to offer our free hitch pin uh, offering. If you send in your yield or take a picture of your yield monitor as you're harvesting Mershman soybeans and send it in to me and uh, Alex will post uh, the text number. To take a quick picture. Make sure you got your name, address, and the variety information on there and we'll send you a hitch pin. So I've been sending these out this week and uh, some really, really nice yields and I think uh, uh, you'll be happy you have one of these when you need it. So that brings us to the joke of the day. An old geezer who had been a retired farmer for a long time became very bored and decided to open a medical clinic. So this is something farmers may have to look forward to another uh, <laughs> uh, opportunity here. He put a sign up outside that said, get your treatment for $500. If not cured, get back $1,000. Dr. Young who was positive that the old geezer didn't know beans about medicine, thought it was a, would be a great opportunity to get $1,000. He went to Dr. Geezer's clinic and this is what happened. Dr. Geezer, I have lost all taste in my mouth. Can you please help me? Nurse, please bring medicine from box 22 and put three drops in Dr. Young's mouth. 
Ah, that's gasoline. Congratulations, you've got your taste back. That'll be $500. Dr. Young gets annoyed and goes home and comes back after a couple days, figuring he'll recover his money. I've lost all my memory. I cannot remember anything, Dr. Geezer. Nurse, please bring me medicine from box 22 and put three drops in the patient's mouth. Dr. Young says, oh no you don't, that's gasoline. Dr. Geezer says, you've got your memory back, that'll be $500. <laughs> Dr. Young, having lost $1,000, leaves angrily and comes back after several more days and says, my eyesight has become weak, I can hardly see. Dr. Geezer says, well, I don't have any medicine for that, so here's your $1,000 back. And Dr. Young says, but that's only 500. Dr. Geezer says, congratulations, you got your vision back. That'll be $500. <laughs> the moral of the story is just because you're young doesn't mean that you can outsmart an old geezer. <laughs> so we'll leave it at that for this week. We'll see you next week. Please be safe out there when you're harvesting and uh, hope you and your family uh, continue to be healthy. We'll see you next week. Make it